Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Set Apart here on KEOS 89.1 FM, College Station, Brian. I'm your host, Tyler, and this is a show about religion, spirituality, and living as a person of faith in the modern world from a Jewish perspective. Before I say anything else today, I have to, of course, mention the terrible tragedy that happened in Israel last week. I'm sure nearly everyone's heard by now, but on the off chance that maybe someone hasn't kept up with the news for the past week, there was a Lagba Omer celebration that went horribly wrong. A bunch of people, the last report I heard it was an estimated 100,000, pretty much purely Haredi Jews from what I understand, got together on Mount Miron in the Upper Galilee to celebrate the holiday, and at some point a stampede started, and as last I heard, 45 people were killed and 150 of them were injured, many critically. And this is actually now being called the worst civil disaster in Israeli history. Now, before I go on any further, I just wanted to briefly explain Lagba Omer for those who may not be familiar. It's a relatively minor holiday and not one that is biblically mandated, although it tends to be a much bigger event in Israel than it is in the diaspora. We are, of course, in the period of the counting of the Omer right now, and Lagba Omer takes place on the 33rd day of counting. The period of counting the Omer, in addition to waiting for Shavuot, is also a period of mourning for the thousands of Rabbi Akiva's students who were killed in the first century due to both a plague and being killed by the Romans for supporting the Bar Kokhba revolt. The 33rd day also has two areas of significance. One, it's said to be the day when the plague ended, and two, it's the day when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed the secrets of the Kabbalah in the Zohar, which is the foundational work of Kabbalah. And some say this date also marks his death. So this holiday has some significance for all Jews, but it's especially important for Kabbalists, like the Hasidic community. Kabbalah, of course, is not mainstream, but it does have its share of students and admirers. Regardless, there are some celebrations associated with this holiday both in Israel and abroad, the most well-known being the lighting of bonfires. In some traditions, namely the Ashkenazi, the general mourning customs associated with the counting of the Omer are lifted from this day, so it's common to engage in activities that are normally forbidden during the period, such as cutting one's hair, holding weddings, etc. Festive meals, dancing, and even parades are also closely associated with this holiday to varying degrees based on community. Now, the reason why it's such a bigger deal in Israel than elsewhere is because one of the traditions associated with the holiday is a pilgrimage to Rabbi Shimon's tomb, which is in the city of Miron. This isn't something that's required of every Jew or anything like that, but naturally those who are closer to the area want to partake of this custom, so it's on the mountain that people light their bonfires, dance, and give gifts of drinks to others celebrating the holiday. Normally, all of this goes off without a hitch, but not always. There was actually another incident that happened in 1911, before the state was even established, in which a balcony railing collapsed and a large crowd of people that caused about 100 to fall, killing seven immediately, and four others died from their injuries a few days later. This is, as far as I know, the only other incident, and it happened in a crowd of 10,000, so about a tenth of those who were there this year. And by the way, for some time now, the state has expressed concern with the number of people who attend this event every year, but so far they've been largely unsuccessful, legally, anyway, in gaining any sort of control over it. Last year, the state put a restriction on travel to the area for the holiday, obviously due to COVID concerns, limiting it to 1,000 people, but that restriction was lifted this year as long as those making the pilgrimage were vaccinated. And we talked before on the show that Israel has an extremely high rate of vaccination by now. As far as we know, what happened is that several hundred people left the site shortly after the fires began. The way down the mountain is very narrow and very slick, with a few makeshift walls put up to try to keep things orderly. However, there are no rails to hold on to, so you just have to try to keep your balance, or, as some people did this time, try to steady yourself against other people in the crowd. What happened, again as far as we know, is that the tragedy that unfolded was a combination of panic and accidents. Security was on the site trying to keep people coming through at a steady pace, but some people started passing out due to, I guess, the heat and lack of breathing room due to the crowding. Some people also slipped on the slick surface, and some of the attendees said that this was made worse by a lot of spilled drinks on the ground. This is what caused the first part of the stampede. The people who fell down were quickly overtaken by those behind them. The panic was what caused the rest. And for anyone who's ever been in a situation like this, you know how easily this can happen. I've never been to Mount Miron, but I've seen minor crowd crushes happen in a variety of situations. At concerts, when I lived in New Orleans, at Mardi Gras. There was this one time in high school where we had a bomb threat and a stampede started during the evacuation procedure and a number of people got injured. And all of these things I've seen were on solid ground, so you can imagine what it's like going down a steep, slick surface with nothing to hold on to. One person goes down, and it's really easy for things to pile up. Medics were able to get to some of the people, but obviously the whole thing was just a mess, and not everyone was able to be helped, at least not in a timely fashion. 
So Israeli police are continuing to investigate what happened, but it seems right now that it was probably unpreventable given the size of the crowd and the nature of the terrain. And as I mentioned earlier, 45 people were killed on site with more than 100 injured, some of whom may still not make it, and that makes this the worst civil disaster in the state of Israel's history. Certainly our prayers go out to those who are injured and the families of everyone who suffered and died on that day. It's really just awful, and it's always awful when stuff like this happens at a time when people are supposed to be celebrating. I wonder if this event actually will work its way into the history of Lagba Omer. We already remember the plague that killed many of Akiva's students, but perhaps in future years we'll also remember this tragedy and mourn for the people who were lost there the same way we mourn for Akiva's students. I do hope, though, that this will be incentive to work something out regarding the crowd control for this pilgrimage. I know a lot of people would love to go every year, but given what happened last week and in 1911, perhaps the thousand-person limit they put on the event last year wouldn't be a bad idea, or at least restrict it to a couple thousand. People may have to attend in shifts from year to year, or maybe this is something you can do once or a couple of years in your lifetime and then leave the rest to other people to have their turn. I don't know, but something has to be done about it, though, because even one death per year is totally unacceptable. Prime Minister Netanyahu declared this past Sunday to be a day of mourning for those who were lost in this tragedy, but as we normally do here on the show for those who pass, we'll observe a minute of silence. May their memories be for a blessing, and may a tragedy like this never strike the land of Israel or anywhere else ever again. So I didn't really have a lot planned for today. As I've indicated in the past couple of weeks, I've not been having a lot of earth-shattering things come to mind. I guess I've just had too many things on my mind, really. Which is okay. I wouldn't say anything I've done thus far has been earth-shattering. But I didn't really have anything insightful that just popped into my head this week. That being the case... I thought we might continue with something we did a few weeks ago, which is to read a little bit from Perkei Avot. Perkei Avot, of course, is a segment of the Mishnah that deals not directly with Halakha, but rather with quotes of wisdom from the sages, many having to do with normal human ethics. It's almost like a rabbinic form of the Book of Proverbs, with wisdom coming not just from the Torah, but from many years of personal experience. It's a nice little collection, short and to the point, so I recommend having a read through if you ever have the time. You can skim through the whole thing in probably 10 to 15 minutes, although it certainly takes more time to get everything out of it that you can. So the segment I wanted to look at today comes from the first chapter very early on, and it has to do with the teacher-student relationship. Actually, we're going to be looking at a few passages today that I think all tie into it, but the cornerstone will be this saying from the first chapter. I wanted to talk about this because, having spent so much of my adult life in the realm of higher education, I've thought a lot about learning and the best ways to go about it. I've noticed things that have worked for me and those that have worked for others, I've also noticed some changes and even, in some cases, some fluctuations in how things are taught over time, some with which I agree and some with which I don't. I definitely have my way of approaching learning and the student-teacher relationship, but know that others swear by different tactics. Regardless, I thought it would be interesting to see what the sages had to say about this. So I'll get on with it and just read this passage from chapter 1. Yosef and Yozer used to say, Let thy house be a house of meeting for the sages, and sit in the very dust of their feet, and drink in their words with thirst. There are really two things it's saying here. First is about letting one's own house be a meeting place for the sages. All the commentaries seem to agree on what this means, which isn't surprising because it's pretty straightforward. I think we can actually look at it both in a literal and somewhat figurative way, but the commentaries tend to focus on the most literal interpretation, that we should open our homes to men, and women for that matter of learning, so that we're able to take in their words of wisdom and grow from that which they have to teach, namely Torah. The Rambam and others see this as sort of doubly beneficial, we get to learn something by making our homes available to scholars, but we also benefit from having our homes be centers of learning in the community. As far as our personal benefit, Bart Nura compares this to walking in a perfume shop. 
Perhaps we don't end up buying anything, but it's impossible for us to leave the shop without taking on some of the wonderful scents within. In the same way, making our homes available to scholars ensures that, one way or another, some of their knowledge and wisdom is bound to rub off on us. And, like we've mentioned before, it causes one to have good standing in the community, to be known as someone whose house is always open to learning, so much so that it just may be expected that if there's learning to be done, people will immediately think of you in your place. And while it's definitely good, it was really the second part of this passage that caught my attention. The part where it says, and sit in the very dust of their feet and drink in their words with thirst. So what does it mean to sit in the dust of their feet? Well, the commentaries have two ways of looking at it. One is to suggest that you should follow behind your teacher and they're walking along with allow dust to kick up behind them and thus get on you. So kind of like, you know, make sure to always follow behind your teacher. The second and perhaps more accurate way of looking at it is that in the ancient world, including in the time of the sages, it was common for the teacher to sit in a chair or in some other elevated position while the students sat on the ground, in the dust, so to speak. And this was common not just in home teachings, but also in the academies. And not just in the Jewish world, by the way, it was actually pretty common the world over for teaching to be done in this manner, with the instructor sitting in an elevated position over their students. The last part of it, and drink in their words with thirst, instructs us to lap up wisdom and knowledge from our teachers in the same way a person who's thirsty would lap up water. It calls to mind some of the ways we hear Torah and its wisdom described in the Bible and in the Talmud, as essential as water or as sweet as honey. We should thirst for knowledge and wisdom or crave it every bit as much as we would food or water, and this should be a thirst that in some ways is never quenched because we always have more to learn. These last two parts really tell us a lot about the ideal student-teacher relationship, that the teacher is in an elevated position above the student and that the student longs for the teacher's words. There's another passage in Pergea Vote that I think really helps flesh this out more fully, and this comes from chapter 5. Here it is. There are seven characteristics in a clod and seven in a wise man. A wise man does not speak before one who is greater than he in wisdom, and does not break into his fellow's speech, and is not hasty to answer. He asks what is relevant, and he answers to the point, and he speaks of the first point first and of the last point last. And concerning that which he has not heard, he says, I have not heard, and he acknowledges the truth. And the reverse of these are the characteristics of a clod. So there's a lot of stuff we could unpack here, and the commentaries do go on about it at a great length. However, let's just try to look at the big picture here. This first part is very important to this idea of the teacher being elevated above the student. A wise man does not speak before one who is greater than he in wisdom. So we see here that there is some value to adopting a somewhat submissive stance in the presence of a wiser person. The rest of the passage is sort of playing off of this and warning about being too quick to speak, as well as being overly opinionated, especially as it relates to irrelevant things. It's also a warning against BSing certain answers, and it emphasizes the importance of being open and honest as much about our ignorance as about our knowledge. Now then, just looking at these two passages, we're sort of getting a picture painted here about how the student-teacher relationship should ideally exist. Namely, that there's a lot of quiet and careful consideration coming from the student, while the teacher largely takes the dominant role. And to be honest, this has pretty much always been my style of learning and approaching the educational process. In fact, on occasion, I've gotten into trouble in classes for not speaking enough, preferring to just sit and listen. But this is kind of what made me take notice of this passage today, the way in which student-teacher dynamics have really changed in the modern era, especially as it relates to higher education. I feel like I've noticed more and more of a shift in the power dynamics between professor and pupil. By that, I mean that the authority, I guess you could say, of the teacher has been steadily eroded in favor of this idea of student and teacher being more or less equals. I mean, it's not 100% like that, but I feel like there's a move in that direction. For example, I remember the first time when I was an undergrad hearing a professor say that we could call him by his first name. I've since heard that a number of times, and in fact, even when the professor doesn't state that this is something they prefer, it seems to be more common for students to just refer to them as such. And it appears like this becomes more and more common the higher you go. It was virtually non-existent in high school, became a bit more common in undergrad, and much more common in graduate school. Personally, I've never been able to do this. Even when professors or rabbis tell me to call them by their first name, I just can't. Part of that is probably just inflexibility on my part, but another major issue is that I have a problem thinking of my various teachers as equals, because if I do, I start to feel like my knowledge or my guess is as good as theirs. I've also never understood the whole my professor's my friend thing, because like your parents, your teachers aren't there to be your friends. And how do you give your friend a bad grade? It doesn't really work out like that. Another thing I've noticed is becoming more common is this sort of interactive, conversational form of teaching. 
Now, I'm not entirely against this. I think lectures are incredibly boring in many cases and can be much less engaging than a conversation. At least having to talk about something keeps you on your toes and ensures that you make whatever preparations you have to in order to keep up with your lesson. There's nothing worse than being called on to speak about a subject when you haven't read up on it. I've seen this used very effectively and also very poorly, and that may just be the nature of the beast and highly dependent upon the professor carrying it out. But I have noticed that this does tend to work a little better when a professor has a high degree of control over the class, especially if the professor is able to command the respect of their students. I think it works to great effect when the students largely discuss amongst themselves with the guidance of the professor and when everyone agrees to shut up when it's the professor's time to talk and gracefully accept correction from the professor when necessary. Same thing when working with one's rabbi, and I think that in many cases that one can go south much quicker because students aren't dependent on the rabbi for a grade, unless we're talking about a religious school of some sort. But I guess my overall point is that if this method is not carried out in an effective way, it can put the students and teacher on too similar a level and actually interrupt the education process. Some may say, what's so wrong about the student and teacher being equal? Is not equality a good thing? Well, sometimes it is, when the equality is based on something that's fair and reasonable. But in education, any kind of education, religious or secular, the whole point is that intellectually, it's not equal. No one goes to school to learn things they already know, unless they're just a fan of wasting their own time. And likewise, it doesn't make sense to have a teacher who knows just as much as the students. The students may as well teach each other if that's the case. The point is that the teacher is the expert and the student is the novice. The teacher's purpose is to give the knowledge and the students is to receive. This is why I think that terms like master and apprentice are actually much better as they more accurately convey the nature of the relationship. But I get that people aren't as comfortable with those terms as they used to be, so whatever. But I fear that sometimes the nature of this relationship is getting lost the division between expert and amateur is getting more and more blurred. And let's be honest, some teachers have brought this entirely on themselves. They've done this by being too casual in their classrooms or in their relationship to the students, or by neglecting their teaching duties by using their classrooms as a soapbox for any number of personal opinions. And I do understand that sometimes this is what endears teachers to students. Sometimes the students think it's cool to have a teacher who spends most of the time ranting about something only mildly related to the subject instead of focusing on learning goals. I had a few teachers like that in school, especially in high school. You know what we called those classes? Easy A's. We didn't learn jack in them, but they were always very amusing. Anyway, oftentimes situations like this break down the sense of respect that students have for their teachers, instead replacing it with amusement. Another issue with this, especially in the realm of higher education, is poor quality of instructors. Adjunct faculty have made up an increasingly large portion of lecturers, and the quality of such instructors is, simply put, very hit or miss. I've had some great adjunct professors in my life, some who were better than the full professors because they brought a lot of real-world experience into the classroom. Of course, I've also had a number who were just terrible and had no business being there. So it's easy to see why sometimes establishing a healthy respect for the teacher among the students can be a problem if the teacher doesn't really prove themselves worthy of such respect. But students aren't off the hook for this. No way. In truth, it actually takes a great degree of humility to be a good student. A good student, kind of like it mentions here in Perkea Vot, is one who's confident in what they do know, but even more so than that, is willing to acknowledge how much they don't know. And naturally, they have to be able to handle correction and constructive criticism. For a lot of students, this is easy. For a lot of others, it's not. Exactly why it isn't easy is anyone's guess. Some people are naturally arrogant and feel like they have to be right all the time. Some people are coddled to the point of thinking that their view is always valid simply because it's their view, even if it's idiotic and not based on anything substantial. Some people have a lot of early victories and become overconfident, especially if they're always being told how smart and talented they are, and then they start getting the idea that they know everything already. And then there are some who just simply have issues with authority, or who, like we mentioned a minute ago, are so obsessed with the idea of equality among people that they forget that there's a natural inequality between the knowledgeable and the ignorant. And the only way to fix this is to acquire knowledge or wisdom. It's something that takes time and work. It isn't something that just naturally exists. And until you've acquired it, there's going to be this imbalance, and that's perfectly normal and perfectly fine. And I think that's really the point of the original passage we read today, especially when it tells us to sit in the dust of our teacher's feet and to drink in their words. I think in this modern age, a lot of us can be uncomfortable with the idea of elevating our teachers in this way. We don't like the idea of casting ourselves at our teacher's feet. We don't like the idea of them being our intellectual or religious betters. Perhaps most of all, we don't like being told that we should just shut up for a while and listen and think, you know, contemplate what we're hearing rather than giving our two cents. And that can be very hard because to a number of us through modern technology, 
We've grown quite accustomed to being able to share whatever we think at any time of day, sometimes to large numbers of people. Like I said, to be a good student really requires one to be humble and to come to grips with the fact that someone is always going to know more about something than we do, and to sometimes just put aside what we know and focus on the things we don't know. This also means admitting when we don't know something, or worst of all, admitting when we've made mistakes. You can probably learn more from screwing up than anything else, and that can be really hard to do if you aren't willing to accept the fact that we can and do screw up. The best students in the world, I think, are not necessarily the smartest, but the ones who are the most open to correction and who preoccupy themselves with the questions rather than basking in the answers to things they already know. But here's one final thing I'm sure everyone is wondering. Is it really so good to place all of your faith in a teacher like this? What if your teacher is bad and in deferring to him, you end up taking in a lot of bad information? Well, that could probably be another show altogether. If you want to hear some more about it, let me know. But for right now, I'll just stick with this. In school, you don't always have a choice about who teaches you, but certainly you can choose the rabbis or other mentors to whom you listen. So who do you choose? For the moment, let's look back at the passage in chapter 5. It says that a wise man doesn't speak before one who is wiser than he is. It doesn't say he can't speak. In fact, this passage encourages us to ask questions and to give answers, basically to engage in dialogue with our teachers. But it notes that we shouldn't be quick to answer. We should be very careful, contemplative. We need to ask questions which are relevant to the topic, not ones that are superfluous or trivial. These are part of the learning process too, not just listening, but engaging in a meaningful way, not one that's disruptive or unhelpful. This can actually help us to learn a lot about our teachers and whether or not they should be receiving the level of attention we've discussed here today. There are many other ways to determine, for example, the best rabbi from whom to learn. And like I said, if you want me to cover this some more sometime, then just let me know. But the primary point I'm trying to get at today is regarding the proper treatment of such figures when we know who they are. Sure, if they're bad teachers, then don't listen to them. You're doing yourself a disservice by listening to people who aren't worthy. If all your professors at college don't know anything, then go to another college. If your rabbi doesn't know anything about Torah, then go find someone who does. But if we don't follow these basic levels of respect for our teachers, and if we in turn don't know how to be good students, then we'll never really find those who teach the truth and teach it well. We'll just assume that everyone who says something we don't like is wrong, rather than having the humility to ask ourselves if we're the ones who maybe don't know what we're talking about. The first step is to listen, and there's no better place to do that than at a teacher's feet. Okay, I think that'll just about wrap up this show. Again, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone in Israel who was in any way involved with the terrible tragedy that happened last week. Unfortunately, I don't know a lot of ways that we can help over here. I know that there are lots of mass blood drives going on there, but that's something we can't really do at the moment. However, United Hadzala is taking donations to help with this in any way that they can. So if you are interested in that, I have put up a link on the show's website, setapartradio.com. Go there and check it out if you're interested in giving. And prayer always helps too. That's something anyone can do, and it is very effective. So if you're looking for some way to help, but you just don't know how to or don't have the means to, you can always offer up prayers. The people certainly need it. As you hopefully know by now, you can catch us here every Thursday, 4.30 p.m. on KEOS 89.1 FM. And check out the website as well, setapartradio.com, if there's anything you missed or need to catch up on. Okay, I am out of here, but I will see everyone next week with something. In the meantime, shalom.